This week on Discover Wisconsin, we're driving along the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail, created to celebrate the genius of Wisconsin's native son. Hello and welcome to Discover Wisconsin. This is an anthem For those who look for more And never say they've seen it all Windows and blacks Take a ride The good lads great Tonight Hi, everyone. Welcome to Discover Wisconsin. I'm Stephanie Klett, Secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Tourism. Frank Lloyd Wright is considered by many to be the greatest architect of all time, and he was born and raised right here in Wisconsin. Some of his most impressive buildings can be found here in our state, including his own home, Taliesin. Today, the Discover Wisconsin crew and I are driving along the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail to give you a glimpse into this architectural journey. The Frank Lloyd Wright Trail was established in 2016 to celebrate the Wisconsin architect, born in Richland Center in 1867. Visitors can travel the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail on a self-guided driving tour to nine stops across southern Wisconsin, tracing Wright's steps from his birthplace to some of his most famous buildings. Mariah will kick things off in Racine, where you can find one of Frank Lloyd Wright's most impressive corporate designs. Frank Lloyd Wright began the designs for this building in 1936. He designed everything in the room, even down to 40 pieces of unique furniture. So how did Frank Lloyd Wright become the official architect for SC Johnson? So our leader at the time, H.F. Johnson Jr., actually had a different local architect, but his plans were not exactly to H.F.'s vision. So he had had someone suggest to him to look at a Chicago-based architect named Frank Lloyd Wright. H.F. took the trip over to his home in Taliesin, and that first interview was a little rough. Really? Yeah, the <laughs> men gave it back and forth and traded insults, and H.F. was always known to say that Frank did a better job at it. But he was also known to say that if a man could talk like that, he really must have something. The relationship between the two men was very interesting. They were both titans of their industries, strong visionaries who really challenged each other to create something amazing, just like the opportunity we're standing in right now. The detail itself, that's what you pay attention to when you first walk in it. Yeah, the great workroom as part of the administration building is a very unique place. Um, it's not your average workspace. And there's a lot of unique features to it, including our birdcage elevators. They give a panoramic view of the entire room. So another really unique part of this building is the Pyrex tubing, or the windows that surround all of it. And actually, if you laid the tubing end to end, it would stretch 43 miles. We also have these columns that Frank Lloyd Wright called dendroform, meaning tree-like. So he thought that he could bring nature inside using these columns, and he envisioned it almost as a glade of trees, and the sunlight filtering down through the leaves would bring that natural element to the employees working in here. So this was the first building that went up on the SC Johnson campus? Correct, yep. The administration building was the first one completed in 1939. But after World War II ended, HF knew that he would have a need for a new research and development facility. So our research tower opened in 1950, and it's actually home to four of our iconic brands, Raid, Glade, Pledge, and Off. What are we looking at here? This is a couple of our original blueprints that show the early designs of the tower. Another piece that makes the research tower unique is the taproot system, where the actual core of the building goes deep into the ground and it supports the entire structure. And it's one of the largest buildings ever created on the cantilever principle. I can't say I've seen a lot of research towers, but something tells me that most of them don't look like this. <laughs> you would be correct. The research tower is a very unique design. And actually, the 15 floors have an alternating mezzanine and main level, which allowed the 10 scientists that were on each floor to easily collaborate by shouting up and down from the mezzanine and also utilizing the dumbwaiter to pass materials back and forth. Nothing compares to seeing these buildings for yourself. To learn how to book your own tour of the SC Johnson campus, Head to discoverwisconsin.com. Coming up, we visit one of Frank Lloyd Wright's famous prairie-style homes. Discover Wisconsin will be right back. We're continuing our journey along the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail right here on Discover Wisconsin. Frank Lloyd Wright's work with the Johnson family didn't end upon completion of the SC Johnson headquarters. 
H.F. Johnson later commissioned Wright to design his own home, Wingspread. This home was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1989 and is now open to the public for tours. The Johnson family lived in this home from 1939 until 1959. The family, when they saw it, the children especially, were very surprised because it was so different from their neighborhood with traditional style homes. I noticed the big windows right away, and I also noticed the contrast in the ceilings. I know that's a big Frank Lloyd Wright Definitely. characteristic. A lot of control and manipulation in his buildings. He yeah. wants you to feel and live in his homes a certain way, and he wants you to feel uncomfortable and claustrophobic when the ceilings are low, and he wants you to want to get out and get into these spaces that open up. What are some of the unique features of wing spread? Well, the daughter, Karen, uh, requested a Juliet balcony. Being a teenage girl, she just thought that would be very romantic. We also have the crow's nest. Uh, that was more for Sam, and Sam was a young boy and could crawl up into the crow's nest. And this home was the largest and last prairie-style home that Mr. Wright designed, but it's great to remember that this was a home and that people lived here for 20 years and thoroughly enjoyed it while, while they did live here. One of the places Wright called home was Madison. Let's hand things over to Jake as we continue along the trail in Wisconsin's capital at the buildings Wright designed here, including this city fixture, Monona Terrace. Set on the shores of Lake Monona in downtown Madison, Monona Terrace was completed more than 50 years after Wright proposed his design. Ed Linville is a Madison-based architect at the forefront of preserving Monona Terrace and whose interest in Frank Lloyd Wright began when he was a child. I was like 10 years old and I saw this building in Mason City and I said to my, my uh, folks, uh, what's that Japanese building doing in Iowa? <laughs> you know, and that was uh, actually uh, a Wright project that he had designed. Ed's early exposure to Wright turned into a lifelong interest in architecture, and his career led him to work under Herb Fritz Jr., one of Frank Lloyd Wright's apprentices. One, one of the things that, that I've always felt privileged about is the fact that, that uh, Herb was a direct lineage uh, with Frank Lloyd Wright. Herb's father was a draftsman for Wright, and Herb's grandfather was a stonemason. So that, that would kind of put me in third or fourth generation from, from Frank directly. And what was Frank Lloyd Wright's goal when it came to, you know, having the Monona Terrace in Madison? I think basically it, it's, uh, you know, it was a, like, a lifelong effort where he wanted to, to gift the city with, with uh, some of his work. I believe that, that essentially, even though his hand wasn't physically uh, involved, a lot of the folks that, that uh, had been touched by him, who, who knew him, actually were involved with the, with the project. So uh, I think the inspiration from Wright was there, the organic quality. I mean, if you think about it, the building and the, and the lake are so uh, in union, you know. They, they just feel like they, they blend together, and that's the philosophy of organic architecture. And the entry is beautiful, but the, the uh, lake is, is the reason that the building exists. What about the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail? Why would you tell people, hey, you got to check this out? I think, I think that what's great about it is it, it shows an evolution. Uh, in, in Wright's case, you have to see where he came from and where he was going, you know. So it, there's no ending and beginning. It's just kind of like an evolution, you know, and, and I think that's why the trail is so important. Head to discoverwisconsin.com to download a free itinerary for planning your road trip along the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail. Coming up, discover another hidden gem in Madison, and later, Mariah drives along the trail to Spring Green. Stay with us. Discover Wisconsin is back, exploring the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail. One of the most impressive things about Frank Lloyd Wright was his ability to design buildings of all kinds, homes, businesses, convention centers, schools, and even churches. Completed in 1951, just a few years before Wright's death, the first Unitarian Society meeting house on Madison's near west side is considered one of the most innovative examples of church architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright was a member of this congregation, the First Unitarian Society, and his parents were founding members in 1879. It was a small congregation at the time, only about 60 families. 
The congregation did everything it could to defray the costs by doing the work themselves. Uh, it was ultimately a labor of love uh, to get it finished. Wright always capitalized the word nature. One of his quotes was, nature is all that we will ever see of the body of God. And, and that's the inspiration for, I believe, organic architecture and especially for this building. Wright's connection to the First Unitarian Society led him to pour his heart into designing the Meeting House. But as Mariah discovers, our next stop on the trail is home to some of his most personal projects. About an hour west of Madison lies the town of Spring Green, a place that inspired Frank Lloyd Wright arguably more than anywhere else in Wisconsin. Well, he loved it because it was his family's background. It was where his mother came when she came from Wales. He was born in Richland Center, right down the road. After he left Chicago, he built Taliesin, and that was the home he came back to throughout his life. Marianne McKenna and her husband, John, have followed Wright's life journey from his humble Wisconsin roots to his life in Oak Park, Illinois, and beyond, before settling in their own Frank Lloyd Wright-inspired cabin just outside of Spring Green. So you're pretty passionate about all things Frank Lloyd Wright, it sounds like. What is it about him and his work that you love so much? Well, you know, I grew up in Madison and there were prairie homes in the area that I grew up in and I was always attracted to them. When I was 12 or 13 years old, um, I saw Frank Lloyd Wright walking down State Street in Madison. He had a flowing cape and a cane and a book by hat. He was quite the character. <laughs> he left a legacy, there's no doubt about that. One of the last buildings that he designed before he, he died was the Wyoming Valley School. Anna Lloyd-Jones, Frank Lloyd Wright's mother, was a teacher. And he donated much of that building when he designed it and the materials and um, actually the design in honor of his mother. Today, Wyoming Valley serves as a community center dedicated to the arts. The organic design of this building can inspire all who walk through its doors. The Wyoming Valley School is the only public elementary school that Frank Lloyd Wright ever designed. It's a great place because it's gone back to its roots. It was originally an elementary school, and now, years later, it's still teaching kids and adults in the arts. What is it about the Wyoming Valley School that you think is so inspiring to people who visit? Well, I think first, it's Frank Lloyd Wright roots. Mm -hmm. Second, you'll always want to point to the artists and others who are teaching in that space. Um, because people who are inspired by this space come to teach in this space. And I think, finally, you have to talk about the setting. You know, you have to think about this place, all the beautiful nature around us, all the farm fields, influences the architecture, influences the artistic output. The landscape of the Spring Green area had a significant influence on Frank Lloyd Wright, but nowhere is this more apparent than at Wright's very own home, Taliesin. Today, the estate grounds are home to the School of Architecture at Taliesin. Jake is there getting a look at the place where those with a passion for architecture and historical preservation work to ensure Wright's masterpieces remain for generations. Ryan, you, you know, you, you go through the school here, but did you expect to stay here in Wisconsin outside of Spring Green? So when I came here to school, I did not honestly expect to stay here. Through my schooling here and the time spent here in Spring Green in Wisconsin, I really fell in love with Taliesin. I fell in love with the idea of Taliesin and also, quite frankly, fell in love with Wisconsin and decided that I, I wanted to try to work at preservation and work at the work on Taliesin. So Ryan, when you think about the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail, what does that mean to Wisconsin? Well, I think something that's uh, really important about the trail is it's sort of a Cliff Notes version of Frank Lloyd Wright, really. And so I think for Wisconsin, what that means is it's a great opportunity to celebrate one of its native sons and be able to see really a broad swath of his, his works. Share photos from your own journey along the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail using the hashtag DiscoverWisconsin. Before Taliesin became a site for millions of visitors, it served as Frank Lloyd Wright's home and studio. Next, we'll send it back to Stephanie as we wrap up our journey inside the main house to learn more about the man himself. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail right here on Discover Wisconsin. Frank Lloyd Wright lived and worked here at Taliesin from 1911 to 1959. There are thousands of stories within these walls, so let's check it out. He was very 
uh, gentlemanly and welcoming and very generous in everything he did and his actions. And... Minerva Montooth, a senior member of the Taliesin Fellowship, has lived here at Taliesin since the 1940s. When I came, I was just the wife of an apprentice. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then uh, as I got closer and closer, I, I became Mrs. Wright's personal assistant. Tell me about living here in Taliesin. What is it like? Well, uh, all I can tell you is it was inspiring and thrilling right down to every day. And everything you did, Mr. Wright always had an exciting uh, response to what was going on. I traveled with Mrs. Wright a lot, and that's always was fun, too. I have heard so much about the parties here. Yeah. What was a party at Taliesin like? <laughs> well, Mrs. Wright was very creative herself, and she she was usually the inspiration for the parties, and we'd have them down on the pond and with candles all over the lake, and really every party was different and thrilling. Is there a party that sticks out to you that you hosted here in Spring Green? Oh, my. I guess one down on the pond when we had a pirate ship. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Built a little pirate ship over a motorboat. <laughs> But there were always so many interesting people. We had a lot of movie stars. Uh, Charlton Heston, and I happened to know him in college, so that was nice. Elizabeth Taylor one time. You have some good memories. I do have a lot of good memories. It's easy to get caught up in the beauty of Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings and lose sight of the man behind them. But Frank Lloyd Wright was a person like anyone else, with family and friends impacted by his legacy. Brandock Peters is the grandson of Wright's third wife, Ogavana. As a young boy, he came to live at Taliesin following the death of his mother and considered Wright his grandfather. Your grandfather, you know, is considered one of the world's best architects, if not the world's best. But what was he like as your, your grandpa? Yeah, he was a very fine grandfather. I don't think anybody probably believes that he and I wrestled, and my uh, grandmother said, Frank, you're getting too rough. <laughs> that, that was it, that was fun. Being raised here, what was that like? I thought it was just the way every place was. And my grandmother kept telling me, no, Brenda, it's not like other places. <laughs> well, I just like the whole house. I used to play t plastic tinker toys in here for the longest time, building the strangest things. My grandfather would come by and say, what is that? And I would tell him what I thought it was. <laughs> and he'd say, mm-hmm, yeah, and walk on. <laughs> so was this a, a good upbringing? I think it was a fantastic place. I still do. It was a great place. You never know what you'll see or who you're going to meet along the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail. But if one thing is certain, it's that inspiration is waiting for you at every stop. So load up the car and explore this incredible trail. I'm Stephanie Klatt, and I hope to see you out discovering Wisconsin.